Well, welcome everyone. Um, I am so happy you're joining us today for the first part in our three-part webinar, webinar series to discuss our new book that's coming out, When Crisis Strikes, Five Steps to Heal Your Brain, Body, and Life from Chronic Stress. And um, today in the first of our series of webinars, I really wanted to introduce all of um, the Amen Clinic um, people to my co-author that they may not know. Um, and because we want to just talk a little bit about um, why we're doing this book together um, and just how much fun it was when we did it. So I want everyone to meet Dr. Chel Tuda Hovick. Um, who you don't have to pronounce his name. It took me, I think, three months to be able to <laughs> pronounce it correctly. Um, I think most Americans just call him Shell, like a seashell. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, but for today, I think that'll be okay. Um, but Cheltuda is the correct pronunciation. Very good. Um, and so uh, Dr. Hovick Cheltuda uh, is a clinical neuropsychologist in Norway and actually won PhD of the year um, for all of Norway for his dissertation um, when he did that. Um, he has co-authored uh, multiple uh, academic articles and has written a few book chapters. And the book was actually won, I think it was best book in psychiatry in England in 2018. Is that correct? That's right. Mm. Yeah. So he's smart. Um, he's a professor um, and uh, editor in chief for the Journal of the Norwegian Psychological, or is it Neuropsychological Society? Right. The Neuropsychological Society. Mm. Okay. So editor in chief. It's different than commander in chief, but you might be more qualified. Well, it, yeah, it's morning in California where you are, uh, Dr. Love, and it's uh, evening here, so it's a bit darker. Um, but it, uh, I think maybe, as you, you know, many of your viewers know are familiar with you as the consummate uh, medical doctor that you are. Um, but I mean, I've kind of got to know you as as you're, you're not the you're not the ten minute kind of medical doctor, right? You're you're the thousand questions and let's get to the bottom of this type of doctor, which is a very different thing in my mind. And it was one of the very appealing things that I thought this is a person I really want to work together with and would like to, if I could, um, you know, um, I think that well, I know that you're, you're, you're board certified and you're board certified in psychiatry in uh, addiction psychiatry in addiction medicine and that whole thing. I mean, it's just, wow, that's, that's, that's a lot. Um, and when you go in, when you start to do something, you do it properly and you just kind of kept that up with the board certifications, even though that you maybe haven't, would, didn't have to have it. You were just, you've been working, 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 working to do that. I'm, I'm just, in, you know, impressed. And I, and, and where does that come from? And, um, I mean, I, I, I wanted to just kind of mention a couple of fun facts that I know something about that I think your viewers maybe don't know anything about, um, <laughs> I don't know if that's okay, but, uh, here goes. Yeah, no, the one is. The one is the the one is the obsession about uh, micro pigs, um, and well, okay, I'm a psychologist, so I'll let just that rest. I won't go into that. But the other thing that's they're really so fascinating, cute. they're so <laughs> tiny, like they just they're tiny and they have these little snouts, like they're so cute. I am totally obsessed. You are, um, and billy goats and some other kind of really cute little things. Anyway. Um, the other thing is that uh, was a fun fact that I don't think many know that um, that I discovered, which is one of our first conversations actually, was that um, as a teenager, you were on, on track, you were training to become an Olympic swimmer, right? Olympic, I think it was the backstroke or something like that, backstroke, right? Um, and I had, I had a swimming background too. I started when I was five and, and then when I, and I also started golfing. So when I was 12, I had to make a decision, but so I know a little about swimming and I mean, swimming is, it's a tough sport. You really need to have uh, really strong willpower because you have to endure quite a lot of pain and a lot of tedious, you know, repetition and, and you become very individualistic, I think, um, because you have to depend on yourself. And I think you kind of exemplify that you're somebody who is really in, you know, in control of yourself and you're able to then use that, uh, knowledge and that understanding to help other people then gain some control over their lives if they feel it's it's a little chaotic. Um, it's a little little what we're trying to do and help 
people do with the steps in our book, I think. Yeah. Well, and thank you because you just brought up a mild trauma from my early childhood and why I stopped swimming backstroke and just switched to swimming breaststroke, which I wasn't any good at and because I was afraid of the mean girls. And so we can get into that in another time. We can have our session separately. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, that was a big part of my life. Um, so maybe you want to tell us a little bit um, about um, your research um, and what you have studied. Right. Well, I can I can say a little about that. I'm, I'm an associate professor, not a professor yet, but I'm working on it. Um, uh, my PhD was really on, uh, just to put it easy, simply um, on youth with developmental disorders. So ADHD, Asperger, Tourette syndrome. And what we were looking at really is trying to understand how developmental factors both internal inside their brains and also external in the environment was affecting how they developed and the difficulties they had, the challenges they had, how to adapt. Um, really interesting uh, in, in this kind of field of child development, uh, it was when they were between 12 and 14, 15 years old, lots of things are happening. And we're actually then following them up now 10 years later, that's gonna begin after the new year. So we're gonna be able to see how things came out, how they did and what factors were the important factors to help them come um, and make out into, a, you know, into young, young adults in, in a positive, good way. So. Oh, that's so interesting. Um, well, that's actually one of the reasons, um, you know, there's several reasons that I, I wanted to co-author this book. Um, one of them is not because I like sharing things, for those of you who know me, <laughs> um, but I really appreciate, I work with adults, um, and I appreciated the um, developmental science um, that Shell brings to the book and to the pages of the book. Uh, we'll be talking about this five-step model that we've created together. Um, and having that developmental perspective, I think, is really key. One of the things um, that I actually found fascinating um, that a lot of people don't know about Shell, um, we were talking years ago when we first met and he said, oh, you know, do you have hobbies? And I said, I want to learn how to golf. And he said, oh, well, I used to be a PGA member. And I was like, what? Who is this guy? Who is this Norwegian? He whips out this card. There's actual card. Do you have it? Oh, I didn't. I don't have it with me, actually. <laughs> I don't have it with you. Come on. It means your chance to share your card to the world. Um, but he, you know, he said, oh, I teach golf and I used to coach and what I found out later, so where he lives in Norway is Lillehammer, where the Winter Olympics were, was it 92 or 94? 94, 94. 1994. Um, and so he's worked with ski jumpers. And so he's taken a lot of his knowledge of the frontal lobe, and I'll let you talk about that a little bit. Um, but that was one of the things that was super fun for me on my riding trips. Um, you know, we'd go and I'd work, you know, eight, 10 hours a day on the book. And then it's like, get me out of this house. And so we actually went to the ski jump and um, twice, once I think was maybe springtime. And I was shocked that the team was jumping on, like there was no snow, like they were jumping on this just fake grass, this plastic, plastic right? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we, it, went again in the winter, um, but there's these stairs on the side. You know, I'm just fascinated by this. I'm from California, right? So, you know, people in the Midwest are like, whatever, like, shut up. But like, when you walk up the stairs alongside of it, you see how really steep that is. Mm. It was really cool. Can you just tell us a little bit about how your research on the frontal lobe played into that um, kind of working with training for ski jumping? Well, well, I can say a little, um, just a, a little about the background is that I, I'm, I never was a really great golf player, um, you know, as, as a member of the, in, uh, the Norwegian PGA, um, because I had an injury quite early, but I wanted to kind of, I, I was a, I was an up and coming uh, golfer. And I, and when I, after the injury, I felt, well, what, what should I do with, with the knowledge and the experience? And I thought I could use it as um, you know, to help young young kids learn how to become better golfers. And one of the things I was very interested in was just the mental the mental side of the game. It's almost it's really the X factor, the difference between the you know the the next best and the best athletes really in any sport 
is that mental strength, that willpower and that ability to really channel your, uh, all your resources and all your talents into um, a, a mindset, into a flow that really makes you, you know, a winner or, or the best you can be anyway. Um, so really when I started teaching and I started some golf courses and some clubs here in the, in, in the Lillehammer area, um, what we did was um, we started doing mental training techniques, visualization, type of meditation things, trying to work to really regulate the, the, you know, the ideas, what we wanted to get out of our minds to try to control that, what we want into our minds, you know, the positive things, try to control that. Um, we started with these young golfers and it, and we were doing it in, in Hawkins Hall, which is one of the Olympic arenas. And that's where the, the ski jumpers were training. So they were training in the same area. And they were like, hey, what are you guys doing in that? We were like in a yoga room and we had these kids that were like seven, eight years old. And we they're like, are you getting them to do visualization training? I mean, how is that possible? So, so yeah, so they wanted to, and, and especially the coaches who had been really professional, very, very good ski jumpers were saying, yeah, this is the thing. We need to work on this. We need to do this. Because they were saying like, that a ski jumper, you know, like as you were saying, uh, Dr. Love, I mean, ski jumping, you, at your, when you're on the top of the hill, it's a frightening thing. Um, but, you know, it's very similar to golf in the sense that you're in control of the situation. You're there. Nothing starts before you set your body in motion. It's the same with golf. Nothing happens. The ball's on the, on, on the grass and it's there. And nothing happens until you set your body in motion. And your whole body has to be coordinated perfectly for a good shot or a good jump. So these, these, these ski jumpers, the coaches were saying, well, and, and they, were, they became passionate about playing golf because they said, you know, ski jumping is like, playing golf, but, but jumping 78 times uh, in two or three hours, right? So it's the same process, the same mental process in that type of, uh, uh, that type of sport. So we got them involved and they were starting to, to do that type of visualization training as well. Um, and this was actually even before I had taken my PhD. So it was, I was just kind of curious about how do we, how does this whole, you know, psychological, how does that, the whole way of, of getting prepared to, to, to reach your peak performance or to channel all these resources in a positive way, how can that be, um, what's the background? How does it work? And that's when I started studying psychology. So I went back to, psycho to, to school actually and took my, took my uh, psychology uh, education and then I did my PhD. So now I have a little more information about that but it's really it's really the same type of same same type of training that we're still doing. So it's been a fun fun journey. Yeah, well, it's really interesting to me. Um, I used to live in Hawaii, and um, one of my hobbies was surf photography. And I was really close to the North Shore, and in the winter, pipeline in Waimea, just you know, 30, 40, 50 foot waves. So, and it's mostly shore break. So I didn't need a huge, I had a, a telephoto lens, but I didn't need a giant one. And I had my tripod and I'd go out and shoot. And I had always had this idea that these big wave surfers were just crazy risk takers. That they would just go in because these waves are so tall and fast and that they just jump down and be like, ah, and like, you know, hope they make it down alive. But when I actually got to know a few surfers, they talked about this flow zone. And you talk about this a bit um, as we go through the steps, how we've incorporated that into this model that we created. Because when crisis comes into our life, you know, we feel like we're this ah, going down the front of this wave, but really we can train ourselves to get into the zone so we can actually deal with the crisis. And so I think that's really neat. Um, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we're talking today um, about why we're making the book, why we wanted to collaborate. Um, and I, I think what I, what we share in common is um, we wanted to take what we do in our practices and make it accessible for people who don't have access to us. And we'll talk about how we did that in the next webinar, but I think the big thing is, you know, why do we need to do this book? And, you know, why are we doing this? And why did we do it the way that we did? Um, and, you know, there were a lot of reasons that I was, 
excited about this collaboration. Um, and I've talked about this with you before. Um, but there's a new reason that came up when we were on a podcast last week that I haven't told you about. So when we were guests on, um, we recorded a podcast last Friday that just released today. And uh, the host of the podcast, Jason, um, had asked you a question and you started talking about um, stress and you're like, well, what you really have to do, you just kind of compartmentalize it and then you go doing this and this and this. And I was like, and then Jason's going, yeah. And I'm like, hold, like stop the press. Like who compartmentalizes? Like women don't compartmentalize. And, and you know, I never want to be like gender based and, and making assumptions, but I was just laughing. I was like, no, like I do not compartmentalize. If I have a fight with someone I love, like I don't just put it aside and go like wash the dishes or do chores or run errands. It comes with me. <laughs> so I think having a balance of those perspectives is really important when we're talking about crisis. And for me, what was really exciting is that we we're very insistent. I think we share a stubbornness in common that this book represent each of us. And I think initially um, the editor just said, or someone told us like when, when you co-author a book, it has to be cohesive. It has to seem like one person wrote it. And I remember distinctly saying, no, <laughs> the, the concept being, you know, if I'm blue and shell is yellow then this book isn't going to be green. It's going to be blue and yellow. I mean, ironically, the book is green, <laughs> but just on the cover. Um, but I made an, that analogy long before. So we've divided up the chapters. And so we have the name of who wrote each section. And so you can see each of us has our own um, personal style that's in there. And that's what I love about, um, you know, this collaboration. I think it brings a lot of strength to that. Um, is there anything else that you want to add, Shell, about why you wanted to do the book or um, why you wanted to co-author or anything else? Well, anything I, I weird think, you want to say about me? <laughs> <laughs> I think two things, two things that 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 were that just kind of came up that were a little interesting because you were talking about compartmentalize, right? And and often that's thought of as a man or a, a, a woman thing, but I also maybe we could we could call it like feminine traits and masculine traits. I think we all have that each feminine and masculine in each of us, and and I think our collaboration, um, Doctor Love, has been has been one where you know you brought you have the biology from the medical doctor side, and then I have the maybe the like the psychology uh, from from the psychologist in me side. Um, little different pr perspective there. You have the 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 the, the side of 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 being of of being a woman and looking at at these issues that we're talking about, for example, breakups from that perspective, and I'm you know from another perspective from a male side, and and that was really the start. I think a part of that 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 collaboration was we were thinking about writing a book about bad breakups, and then we yeah. started kind of expanding that and thinking of well, a bad breakup is it is it is a crisis and think of all the other types of crises that, that are there. And it's maybe the same type or similar type of mechanisms that are in those different, those, those problems um, that we can then kind of resolve with, with the model that, that would cover a more general uh, group of type of crises. Um, mm -hmm. And in addition, you're very stubborn and I also am very stubborn, but you're also one that, that, that is very good at listening. And, and I feel I always need a person to, to work together with because I have a lot of crazy ideas and, and I need to have some, <laughs> I need to have someone to say, hey, those ideas are, those are really dumb. And okay, maybe those are okay. okay maybe, maybe we'll look at those, right? So well, I'm not going to put a judgment on your ideas, but I will agree with you that they are endless. <laughs> so, yeah and and I'm used to working here in, in Norway we're used to working um, at the hospital where I work as a team and we need to have people with little different viewpoints uh, men women people with different backgrounds that's always a better result I think because you get all the ideas out there and then you kind of you know look at them turn them up and down, back and forth, and then figure out what actually works. So I've been really blessed to be able to work with you, Dr. Love, and, and just have your input. Um, you know, maybe another fun fact is you can be a little snarky once in a while, a little sarcastic. 
um, then I know that, okay, there's a real friendship there because uh, you don't do that with just anybody. So I appreciate that. <laughs> it look a little bit too, um, I'm afraid. Um, I, I think the final thing I want to say, you know, the other big component that went into this when we were developing the steps, and we're going to talk about that in the second webinar. Um, but this idea that some people feel like they're very strong and don't know how to be soft. And, and some people feel that they have softer personalities or more introverted and don't know how to be loud and big and how both of those are needed when we're faced with life crisis and how important it was for us to incorporate that into the model. Um, and I thought you were the one who was strong and that I was the one who was more um, timid. And then you said you thought the opposite. And so it's, it's really kind of funny, but um, so I guess that's us. That's um, why we're collaborating. It's who we are. Um, and we're happy that you're joining us um, and we'll be answering questions. And we will um, be coming shortly with episode number two, in which we'll describe how we came up with this five-step process um, that hasn't been used before. Um, and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Have a great day, everyone.